I will be talking about DIY EEG. Um, and in particular, I'm gonna be approaching this from my perspective, which is very much not from science and very much from hacking. So what I really wanna get across is what's out there, what's available, what you can start with. I've been playing with this for five or six years and have maybe moved that much further. Uh, I'm hoping to meet some folks tonight to take that quite a bit further and uh, pick up on some of these projects and, and hopefully do some, some new and exciting things. So uh, start off with a warning. I am definitely not a doctor. Do not uh, take anything I say scientifically or uh, at your own risk with, with your own body. Most importantly, be safe. Like, don't hook things up to your body that you plug into a wall. That's <laughs> totally an option, totally not a good option. Um, and I just made this up. I'm sure others have used it. When in doubt, just don't. There's lots of people doing this stuff. There's lots of YouTube videos out there. There's lots of local resources. There's lots of professionals. If you're really interested in something and it looks a little bit sketchy, talk to somebody, check it out, learn more about it, and then proceed as you see fit. So, uh, speaking of EEG, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about where all this started, and in particular, you know, my quest, my focus is on human brain signals, EEG detection, and some basic history on that. I mean, this goes back into the, the late 1800s in, in testing with animals. Um, but from what I could find in 1901 was the first time there was quantifiable data um, detected coming from a human um, with, this, uh, with this crazy contraption called a, a string galvanometer. So this wasn't actually EEG, um, this was um, ECG, and they were detecting uh, heart pulses. Um, and so it was just kind of where, where things started, and you're gonna see this kind of uh, as a trend in working towards the brain. Uh, in the mid-20s, um, alpha waves were first detected and kind of popularized uh, and published in, in the late 1920s uh, by Berger. Uh, at the bottom is actually the, the first known published uh, recording that was, was taken in 1924 and published in 1929. And the top part of the wave that you see is, is from what was actually detected and recorded. And just below that is a 10 hertz reference signal. Um, so that looks pretty close to, uh, uh, it's possibly an alpha wave that's actually being recorded there. Uh, going forward from that, uh, in 1934, um, I have no idea how you actually say this, I'm gonna go with epileptiform spikes, um, is what really started uh, bringing EEG to the attention in more of a clinical setting. And they were able to determine that they could correlate certain brain activities with seizures, and that kind of kicked off uh, EEG as a, as a clinical science and, and future diagnostic tool. Um, in 53, uh, it was used in sleep studies, in particular identifying REM, uh, and in 1988, um, the first BCI or brain control interface, uh, or one of, one of the first was, was documented in actually using uh, brainwave activity to, I believe it was referred to as a, a gadget of mass, um, but some kind of robot uh, was moved around by things going on in the brain. Uh, this is the, 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 the 1911 uh, state of the art, which again, this isn't actually detecting brain waves, but it is uh, detecting uh, electrical activity in the body. Um, it featured water-cooled electromagnets, required five people to operate, and weighed in at about 600 pounds. Um, and you can see uh, the lovely state of the art technology is uh, salty water baths um, as contact points for detecting signals. Um, this is going not quite into modern time, but uh, this is actually a big part of, of what actually got me interested um, in EEG is I actually had a, time, a chance to play around with one of these for a while. Um, I don't know when this one was actually manufactured. I, I think this, this type of equipment was, was popular possibly in, in the 50s or 60s. Um, but basically it's a giant uh, analog amplifier and filter. Um, so I've got some, some pullouts, uh, some details in here. All these crazy magnificent switches and then all the, the multicolored things on the side, that big bank is a bunch of crazy push button filters that let you select different modes. So 
This was uh, an 18 to 16 channel uh, amplifier basically and uh, precision filter. So you'd hook a different electrode into each of these channels and they could be strapped to your brain, they could be strapped to your chest, they could be strapped to sensors that detected uh, your, your, your lungs expanding and collapsing, and then all of that would get uh, recorded in analog glory on a sheet of paper scrolling by under needles wiggling back and forth. Um, and so this is where, like, as far as I can tell, you know, most of the, the, the knowledge and the basis for, for using EEG uh, in particular in, in medical applications came from this kind of technology. Um, and these are also really fun to take apart, by the way. Um, each one of those is modular and slides out, and it's a huge circuit board of discrete analog componentry. Um, you can find them on eBay pretty cheap occasionally. The shipping's probably gonna cost you more than, than the auction. Um, and they're also really fun to hack with and pretend that they're musical instruments because it's really low noise, uh, high quality amplifiers and filters, which musicians tend to be into that sort of thing. So um, I did have some fun hooking up some crazy noise generators and things to it and just twisting dials and making weird noises. Um, so onto uh, uh, traditional EEG, which I'm actually going to uh, veer away from a bit, but I want to kind of set the context for, for what's out there and, and what is fairly well understood. Um, how many people have actually had like a clinical diagnostic EEG where you do the skull cap and you have a doctor, a couple, few people, handful of people? Um, I'd be curious to, uh, to hear what that was like and, and what you got out of that and if you ever want to do it again. Um, but uh, this, is, this is very, very common sort of setup where you, where you have this, uh, this skin cap or uh, scalp cap. And a uh, few things to note are different styles of electrodes. So the, the forehead, your skin, um, is, is you know, somewhat conductive and you can put electrodes directly on it, but you actually want to get all around uh, your skull to detect different areas and things going on in your brain. And most people have all this hair in the way. Um, so one thing that gets a bit messy is you actually use a gel, a conductive gel, uh, to make contact between the electrode and your scalp. So uh, this, this head cap is kind of holding all the electrodes in the right position, and then they're actually filled with gel uh, that's making a, a connection to your scalp to then, then pick up the signal. Um, and there's different versions of this. Um, you can do EEG with a few electrodes to uh, 20 electrodes to over 100 electrodes, just depending on what you're trying to do and the kind of equipment that you're using. Um, this is the most common, uh, you'll, see, you'll see a lot of this in, in EEG reference material, uh, known as the, the International 1020, uh, which is actually the amount of coverage in terms of the distance between the sensors being 10% uh, or 20% of uh, the distance across your head. Um, so this is really kind of like the starting point for, for, for real science and investigation. And to me right now, this is, this is kind of over the line of DIY. Like you can be a serious enthusiast and, and get into this. For me, it's way too much trouble and it's way too finicky and it requires way too much patience. So I'll show you some things that, that start to make this more accessible, but uh, I'm looking specifically at things that are, are much simpler than this and reduce the complexity. Um, although there are a lot of really cool things um, that you can do with this in terms of it gives you a lot of localization data. So you can, you can hone in on more specific parts of the brain, not down to an individual neuron and function, but into are, is your brain processing things visually? Is your brain focused on fine motor control? Is your brain in a heightened state of attention? You can, you can hone in on different known regions of the brain uh, with, with this type of uh, electrode network. Um, this, I just kind of threw in here because I thought it was crazy looking and interesting um, and, and piqued my interest. This is actually what I'd, I'd really love to hear from folks that are doing crazy stuff like this or have other crazy ideas that, that we haven't seen yet. Um, but uh, this, is, this is an alternative uh, to the skull cap. And, and just say too, I, I have no idea if this even works at all. This, this could totally just you know be somebody's dream. Um, and uh, uh, 
Um, but it, it's, it's definitely, I've, I've seen similar versions or simpler versions of this. Um, but one of, the, one of the big challenges with the, the typical electrodes is, is you have this, this thick skull. Um, and, and one thing I didn't, when, didn't mention with the electrodes is everything I'm talking about is, is non-invasive and attaches to the outside of your body. There are really interesting EEG techniques that involve um, probing the brain directly without the skull in the way. That I definitely don't uh, conceive of as, as DIY um, <laughs> type things. Um, but, uh, you know, yeah, there's, um, there's other interesting things. So this is, I'm hoping in a future time to, to do a follow-up talk to this, but I'm really curious to explore uh, the idea of in ear, around ear, and and other ways to uh, to look at pulling out the data um, could be quite interesting. So, um, for a little bit of background, I, I imagine some of this is going to be familiar uh, if if you've ever been curious about about how the brain works. Um, this is a, a, a slightly condensed list. There are there are more uh, understood subfrequencies within some of these ranges. But in, in general, this is, this is what most people talk about when, when they look at EEG and, and brain waves. Uh, and this is sorted from, from highest frequencies to, to lowest frequencies. Um, and some of these are presumed to be better understood than others. Um, and the science and, and research is, is always changing, but there's, there's definitely some, some trends that, that are persistent through it. Um, so with the higher, and again, look at, so first thing overall is really what we're looking at is two to 40 ish Hertz. So if anybody here, I imagine a lot of us here are microcontroller, electronics, computer fans, um, that's not megahertz, that's Hertz. Um, two Hertz is, you know, one, two, three, you know, two times a second up to, uh, you know, 60 hertz flicker like AC. So these are actually really low frequencies compared to most things that, that you might run across. Um, the, the gamma, which is the 25 to 100 hertz, there's a, an interesting phenomenon at 40 hertz detectable in a lot of people. Um, and it's theorized that that's kind of like the refresh rate of the brain. Um, in that it, it, the, uh, the, the signals, the pulses in your brain tend to sweep from front to back at about 40 hertz. Um, and again, there's you know, uh, different information and studies on this, but one, one thing that, that I wanna stress is these are all my interpretations and point of view. There's some scientific papers, there's some trials out there, but it, it, to me, um, you know, I, when I was putting this together, I, I was actually a little bit disappointed because I wanted to like give you guys some really concrete stuff and here's this awesomeness and this does this and this does that. The best thing I can say is it's, it's, it's kind of like reading tea leaves. You know, there, there, there's, there's some hard things that you can pull out of it, but it's so close to what you can just interpret it and, and different things. So, you know, I, I really don't tend to believe strongly in any of it until I see a strong correlation across different things. So, um, you know, sometimes you'll see one thing that's like, oh, wow, this is super clear signal. This is definitely a thing. And then you try it again and it's totally a different thing. So uh, again, that, this 40 hertz thing, I, I've seen some, some interesting evidence to it, but it's, it's one of those things we just, we just don't know what we don't know yet. Um, beta waves are, are generally where it's presumed a lot of the general activity when you're, you're awake and conscious and, and doing things. Uh, you're going you're gonna to be in that 12 to 30-ish hertz range. Um, alpha is, is really interesting. Um, this is where I really recommend um, starting uh, as an area of interest if you want to build uh, your own device or, or try your own tests. Um, you, can, you can generate one of the strongest brainwave signals um, with, uh, with alpha waves just by closing your eyes. So if, if you're just sitting somewhere and you close your eyes, um, the, the, the back part of your brain goes into this nine-ish hertz oscillation. And there's a couple of different theories on it uh, in terms of that's just what, that, that's the frequency of, of not seeing anything. Um, there's other theories that it's a, a, an inhibitor. So it's basically telling your brain there's nothing to see. Quit trying to see stuff that's not there. It's all good. This is just off. Um, and um, it's, uh, it's, it, you, can, you can demonstrate this. I'll, I'll show you uh, 
uh, a video at the end demonstrating this uh, in that less than $100 in hardware in a DIY kit that you can build yourself uh, will allow you to, to observe this uh, phenomenon. Um, theta, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a physical demo at some point as well. Um, I was really hoping to show you the, the alpha waves, but uh, the demo I'm going to show is going to focus on the front of the brain, which, which doesn't generate particularly strong alpha waves. Um, but there is a little bit more going on in the, the theta, which is the, the 4 to 7 hertz. So uh, this is where I think there, there's, some, there's some interesting things in biofeedback. Uh, beta waves uh, are often used in, in biofeedback as well. But you can, you can start to consciously and unconsciously um, interact with your, with your, with your brain waves and your thoughts um, through visual or auditory feedback and, and start to train your mind. It's, it's, the best way I could describe it is you, you kind of get a, a, a sense and a, and a feel of it, but it's a, it's a very zen kind of thing in that if, like, if you look at it, it disappears. But if you just kind of imagine it's there, it's there. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. I'll, it'll be easier to explain later. Uh, and then uh, two hertz down to about a half a hertz uh, is what tends to happen in, in deep sleep or, or known as slow wave sleep. So your, your, your brain is very, very calm. You're, you're, you're effectively unconscious and sleeping. There's no muscle movement or anything like that. And you just get this, this very slow oscillation. Um, and uh, so coming back to the alpha waves, uh, this is one of the videos, and uh, hopefully I'll have some, some sound for you. Um, this is from uh, Backyard Brains. They make a thing called the Spiker Box, uh, which is a, a simple uh, DIY kit. Um, so let's see how we do here with, oh, sorry, hang on. Ah. Uh, so I'm new to Mac, and I have no idea how to make my audio work. Okay. Oh, that's the only way to do it. We can live without the audio if it's. Uh, anybody have any interesting questions or thoughts thus far? <laughs> that's fine I'll, I'll i'll just narrate so what what you're seeing here is his eyes are open and there there's a fairly steady let's say noise pattern there and now when he closes his eyes you see there's a dominant frequency uh being expressed and that's um he's so he's wearing a headband here but the sensors are actually um on the back of his head where the, the signal is the strongest. And so that, that alpha rhythm is uh, uh, generated by a, a, a thalamic rhythm, rhythm in the cells that's just a, a centers around nine hertz. And uh, yeah, here's the, so it's just two electrodes and you know, you see he's got the, the hair on the back of their head and he's just gonna stick some gel in there and then this is a, a reference point for the signal. Um, so here they're just adding some conductive gel. So, I, I put this in here in particular because I think this is this is a great expectation of like what's doable for the average tinker hacker whatever these are these are basic components um, you're you're not dealing with anything super dangerous if you've ever used an Arduino this is going to be right in your wheelhouse yeah I mean what could go wrong I mean it's perfectly you know everybody wash their hands you know it's all it's all science. Um, so yeah, they're just talking through and, and describing what I what I was saying with the um, the, the nine hertz wave there. Um, so oh, we can see bits and pieces. This is all good. If you go to uh, Backyard Brains, um, the one of the other reasons I really like this project is it's well documented, uh, and they have this annotated schematic. And so you can see there's a, there's a few core components here. The the one in the upper left. Um, they're doing a, a a nice common hack with the the power source where they're splitting it, so they're getting both. Um, plus minus four and a half volts out of a nine volt battery source. Um, and then there's a, a basic uh, instrumentation amplifier doing a 4X gain. And then there's another stage with a, a bandpass filter. And then they're using a classic LM386 uh, 20 gain amplifier to drive a speaker. So you can use this to, to actually hear things. Um, another interesting thing that they do with this is you'll find them doing 
interesting experiments with insects. So they call it the spiker box. You can actually use it to record muscle movement in insects and then do a replay attack. And if their leg were happened to be detached, wire it up to the spiker box, replay that muscle trigger and it twitches. Hence the, uh, the spiker in the box. So uh, I, don't, I, I, I definitely know how I feel about research on humans and animals. Uh, I don't know how I feel about that on insects, but it, it, it's used in, in classrooms to teach kids uh, this stuff all around the world. Uh, there's some great videos online if you haven't had a chance to see it. Um, so now what I, what I want to talk about, um, which is kind of the, the focus of why I want to do this talk, is a, a project called Brainduino. And uh, this is uh, an example. They've been playing around with different 3D enclosures. Uh, I was working on this just a few months ago and uh, was testing one of the first enclosures that didn't have a battery. Uh, this enclosure has both this device and a battery in it. Um, so it's, it's easily portable and easy to use. Um, and I'm gonna walk through uh, some of the basics of the hardware. Um, the other thing is everything that I'm talking about tonight Part of why I'm highlighting them is these are all open source hardware projects. So the, the Spiker Box is all open source and documented. The Brainduino is, is all open source and the hardware is documented. And then I'm also going to talk about OpenBCI, uh, which is a, a, a pretty advanced DIY project uh, that's doing some really interesting things and, and also has great documentation and examples. And the founders of that also have great videos uh, and some YouTube talks up where they really go into the details and the background and more of the nuts and bolts and things. So once you get a general film familiarity, if you really want to dig deeper, uh, there's a lot more out there. But in basics, uh, what we have here, um, and, and what I love about this too is th this, this project has been evolving for quite some time. Part of why it's called a Brainduino is the, the prototype and the version one was actually a shield for an Arduino. Um, and, and here it's, 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 it's evolved quite a bit to where it's using a Teensy for the, the processing. Uh, it has a Bluetooth module. And then you'll see it's made up of, of several other modules, which I'll, I'll go into to detail on. Um, I've also never quite seen a, a, a board design like this. Um, there's a, there's a, a carrier PCB underneath. And then the, the different colored bo boards are separate modules with like this hybrid surface mount through through hole edge castellation soldering technique. I don't even know what to call it, um, but it's pretty interesting. Um, long and short though, uh, what this does is it's a thousand X gain amplifier. You're, you, you tend to be dealing with the observable signals that you're getting through your skull, through out, out the skin to these electrodes, down the wires and into the boards are roughly around 100 microvolts. So if you take a 100 microvolt signal and amplify that a thousand times, you get 0.1 volts. So we're talking about teeny, 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 teeny voltages. Um, and this is about 30 years of hardware um, evolution in, in low noise amplification. And, and I also think it's a really interesting combination of, of what I would almost call vintage electronics meets modern electronics. Um, but it, it makes a really interesting combination of both uh, analog and, and digital circuitry. So uh, we've got the, um, uh, in the upper left there, uh, the Teensy, which is the CPU. The blue board below it is, is Bluetooth. Uh, we're also experimenting with a version of this uh, that replaces either or both of those boards with an ESP32, which has both processing uh, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth capabilities. Um, essentially, all of the other boards, the the, the the Teensy is generating a serial output that's then being fed to the Bluetooth. There's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, the green board in the middle is the analog to digital converter. Um, the, the red board has uh, some power and a number of filters on it. The blue board is the input and the initial amplification and filtering. And then optionally, there's also a, a battery or a direct USB connection for this. So on the blue boards, there's two identical boards, um, and uh, essentially you've got um, a die fet, which I'd never, I, I didn't actually know that was a thing, um, but it's, uh, it's a nifty uh, low noise amplifier. Um, and so you have a, a series of amplifiers and, and op amps in here, and um, I'll just briefly talk, I'm not gonna get too technical into, into all of this, but on the left is the input, 
and you can see you have, you have a reference ground, which in this case is going to be clipped to your ear, and then you're going to have a left and a right electrode. And each of those left and right signals come in independently and get amplified, then they, and, and that's boosted uh, with, a, with a 100x gain. Um, and, uh, and op amps that are running rail to rail uh, plus minus 12 volts. And then that's fed into uh, another amplifier, uh, which is then fed through uh, a set of filters. So there's a, there's a high cut, typically around 300 hertz, uh, and a low cut, uh, typically below a hertz. Um, and there's notation on here. Um, this is actually or uh, has been available as a assemble yourself kit. So you can actually go through and do your own component selection. If you want to tweak the filters, uh, they're not in software, they're in hardware. Although there is a lot of software configuration uh, that's also available. Um, so this is the, the, the first board and, and, and this happens twice. And then that feeds into uh, the red board here. And these have, I, I just love saying this, eighth order low pass Butterworth filters. Uh, and it has four of them. Um, and so these are, um, these are actually controlled by software. Uh, they can also be controlled by hardware. Uh, just for redundancy, there's actually a, a 555 chip on here. So if you're trying some experimental processors or things like that and you can't get a, a steady PWM signal, you can actually generate one in here. And that's fed into the filter to set where uh, the filter is clipping at. Basically, the, the filter reads in a PWM signal, and then it sets uh, the, the cutoff based on the duty cycle. So you can have a, a fixed filter by using something like a 555 timer, or you can have a dynamic filter in this case by using GPIO pins to set that filter point dynamically. Um, you also notice there, there's redundancy in the power supplies, so each stage also has its own uh, power regulation, so this runs off 5 volt. There's also 3.3 volt, uh, which isn't used. Um, and then going from the analog to the digital domain, really the, the hardest heart of this system is the AD7173, which takes the now thousand time amplified and filtered signal and processes that into 24 bit samples. Uh, in theory, this can do that uh, over 30,000 times a second, um, not at 24 bits though. So in practice, we're doing multiple channels uh, with a high bit depth, um, and uh, we're easily achieving 250. We're maxing out somewhere in the 500 to 1,000 hertz range. Uh, but given that we're really only trying to detect uh, tens of hertz frequencies, um, any, anything over 100 samples per second is, is going to give us uh, fairly granular data. The, the higher sampling rates are really nice uh, when you're trying to do things um, like phase detection and coherence in terms of looking at the dominant frequency in the right hemisphere versus the left hemisphere. With the higher sampling rates, you can get the granular resolution to see how well those signals uh, are in phase. Um, so. Um, this is my, my backup cue to do a demo. Um, I'll go ahead and fire it up. Um, this is, uh, so I, I've been talking about EEG, which is actually detecting uh, signals coming from inside your skull. It's really hard to do. And it's also like, even when it's working and you have it dialed in, it, it, it's very sensitive, it's very susceptible to noise. Um, it's hard to, to validate the hardware because, you know, maybe you're just seeing tiny artifacts. Maybe that's the actual data stream. So I don't know if anybody can guess. Uh, so I actually recorded this earlier uh, using this hardware. Um, I don't know if anybody can guess what's going on here and what's actually being recorded. Yeah, this is, this is, this is me debuting a fantastically crappy hack which is takingly, taking a perfectly good EEG device and using it as a really bad heart rate monitor. So, um, so this, is the, uh, this is what I'm gonna, I'm gonna put on my forehead um, to, to read some signals. And I basically just took this and put it across my chest and hit record. And you see very clear spikes at, at regular intervals, which are a heartbeat. Um, and so I, I a good start for DIY hacking. This, this is actually, I started doing this maybe 10 or 15 years ago um, with just, uh, you can actually do this with the breadboard and some dip components 
um, and uh, some pennies stuck to alligator clips. Um, and just because it's, it's, it's uh, the electrical signal of, of your muscle, your heart muscle contracting is phenomenally larger than millions of neurons firing in your head. Um, so if, if you are really interested in this, I totally want to encourage people to get into EEG and build awesome brain devices. I think a great start though is looking at things uh, like, like your heart rhythm. And then also you, there's some interesting devices that you can wear on your forearm and different parts of your body uh, that detect muscle movement. And, and that is just such, a, such a, uh, an enormously larger signal by comparison. I think it's a, it's a great place to, to really get familiar with the hardware and the technology and, and build up your base of knowledge. So this is, uh, you know, I, I don't know what you call this, this level of development in terms of, uh, I guess it's, it's, it's consumerized DIY enthusiast hardware. It's, uh, it's not quite ready for, for, for retail market. Um, but, uh, and that's the other thing that's interesting when you develop things like this, like you can see the, the circuit boards have gone through several evolutions and, and are, are pretty manufacturable, especially with the, a little optimization. Uh, but things like where the electronics meet the human, um, we got a lot of, a lot of room to play around with. Um, so I'm going to switch out of this. So. This device, as I mentioned, is, is the Brain Duino. Uh, you, can, you can find a lot of historical information on it. Um, if, if you look up Psychic Lab, um, it, there's also uh, been an iteration of it uh, known as NeuroFox. And then most recently, uh, out of Berlin, uh, there's a new startup called uh, Awake um, that is, is moving forward and, and looking to, to go into production with, with another version of this. So, what I'm showing you now uh, was originally called IBVA and developed by Masahiro, and it's, it's the hardware and software. So this all started using Arduinos, and now we've evolved to uh, much faster microcontrollers. So I'm going to just walk through um, the, the process from the beginning here. And it works with a lot of different devices and hardware, so I'm just telling it that I'm using this NeuroFox version. Uh, and special thanks to the, the Dream team at uh, NoiseBridge. This is actually Kevin's personal device that they were nice enough to loan to me to, to do testing and present on, so thank you very much. Um, so, so now I've connected, and uh, I'm just going to check a, a couple of my settings here, and then go into the visual part. So here we go. Now we're getting data. So this is where, where, where it's tea leaves but in color. <laughs> um, so this, this isn't going to be entirely meaningful because uh, you, you really need to, uh, to sit still and, and kind of focus for a bit. Um, but it, it, it is pretty robust in that we, we are actually seeing things here. So uh, I'm going I'm to stop talking for a moment and just kind of let, let the, the filters do their thing and you'll see what the, the baseline data looks like. So um, w when I close my eyes, you, you might see a, a, a little bit of a tick. Um, but again, the, the, the signal for that eyes closed alpha wave is really coming from the back of the head. And I'm just using a, a left and right uh, hemisphere sensor here. So um, this is another thing where I think there's a lot of a lack of information, uh, especially in, in, in the, 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 the difference between, I really conflated looking at this originally uh, EEG and BCI more or less as, as one and the same thing. And they're actually two very different but, but related things. EEG is purely um, detecting the, the, the pulses uh, and the, the activity and those micro voltages in your brain. BCI is a much more general concept of, of brain computer interface. It, 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 it can be done with EEG. Um, oftentimes part of it is done with EEG. Uh, oftentimes, a lot of it is done with other things uh, than EEG. So you notice I, I showed the heart rate. So you know that's that that that's a biosense that you can pick up. You can also use gyros and accelerometers to detect movement uh, on the surface of the skin. Uh, you can you can detect muscle pulses. You can also do things like optical eye tracking. 
uh, very non-invasive sort of thing where you're able, even if you can't move your arms and legs, uh, you, can, you can still control your eyes and people are able to do things like type on a keyboard by looking at keys and, and changing their focus. None of those are actually using EEG, yet they're the more successful uh, BCI type interfaces that we have. So to, to, to give a simple uh, demonstration, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let it calm down a little bit and then I'm going to think really hard left brain and really hard right brain and and we'll, we'll we'll see what happens here all right so i don't know if anybody saw a giant left arrow and right arrow um yeah neither did i um so, but now you see as I'm moving around, there, there's a lot of data going on. And also really um, on, on, on the far left um, is, is a, a, a few, few hertz. You actually see there's a, a four, eight, and 13. So, so that's four, eight, and 13 hertz. Um, so basically everything below four hertz is, is noise or spurious data. Um, it's muscle movement and, and, and other things like that. Um, at, you know, like actual thinking and, and brain hemisphere activization is, is going to happen more in, the, in the, the alpha to beta. Uh, although what you will see in the theta, if I were to sit here, or if any of you were to sit here for 10 or 15 minutes and stare at this, you'll start to see some interesting things in the theta area when you start to go into more of a trance or meditative state. Um, you, you can actually start to have a, a, a bit of a, a biofeedback experience. Um, so now I'm going to try something a little bit different and, and see if, if I can do a, a, a left-right brain control. So I can, I can sort of trigger left and right. It, you'll notice like if I just tap on my, on my head here, you'll see the, the, the higher frequencies on the right side going up. And if I tap on, on the left side, you'll, you'll see the opposite. So um, one of the techniques that OpenBCI is actually uh, able to do and, and other products like, like NeuroSky is they're actually detecting uh, micro expressions and facial movement. And so uh, by doing imperceptible twitches, you can actually communicate to a computer uh, your intent. But, the, the, but it, it's, it's, it's a hack. Um, I wouldn't quite go so far as to call it a hoax. But it, it's, it's not your brain shouting neurons through the wires. It's you making a physical representation of what you're thinking that is generating electrical activity from your muscle movement. Even your eyes looking back and forth can, can generate register, registrable signals. Um, so uh, I'm going to make this available to anybody afterwards that wants to try this out here over at the bar. Um, we'll, we'll hook some people up and I'm, I'm curious to see some, some brain waves, especially if anybody has a really, really abnormal stuff going on. That, that would be, that would be great. Um, so, uh, just to touch on real quick, uh, this is the, the open BCI project. Um, this launched, uh, a few years ago, actually on Kickstarter, they've done two campaigns. Uh, and I think this has probably been, uh, you know, one of the most popular, most successful projects. Uh, in this realm, and again, it's 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 great open source hardware. Um, the the founders behind it are great communicators. They they put great talks and lectures out there. They're really passionate about this. Um, their 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 big trick here is that that big chip in the middle is is basically a, a single package specifically designed for EEG. It has all the amplification, all the filters, all the magic sauce locked into the chip. Um, and there's even newer generations of these types of chips out there. Uh, I happen to have a couple of samples. I'd love to get them spun up into boards and wired up to heads and, and, and see what we can do with that. Um, the other thing that, that they're doing that's really innovative is the, the 3D printed uh, thing. So they have different versions of this um, that are way more adjustable and flexible than just the skull cap that do 10, 10 electrodes, 20 electrodes, dozens of electrodes, and are able to actually do real spatial imaging um, with this type of setup. So uh, I want to show uh, part of this uh, video, um, which this is using uh, an open BCI unit. 
um, and, and came from uh, a university in, in, in Bangalore. And this is describing something called SSVEP, uh, which is steady state visually evoked potential. And what that means is that if you, exter if you create an external stimulus, then that will uh, create a, a detectable reaction. Again, in particular, it's a visual process, so it's, it's firing in, in, in the back of the head. And what they're doing is they're generating pulses uh, in the range of your normal brain activity, 10, 15 hertz, um, the things that will definitely induce seizures in, in, in certain people. But what they're able to do is they're, they're able to train your brain. So you go through this, this quick training program um, that they're describing here, and basically these three boxes are flashing at slightly different frequencies. And the software in the computer has basically been trained by doing this. You, you look at one, it flickers for seven seconds, it stops flickering for four seconds. You do that three times with three different frequencies, and the computer generates a very simple filter that says, you're looking at this, you're looking at this, or you're looking at that. And so now, by focusing on that top box, it makes that robot go forward. Left box, left, right box, right. Again, it's a total freaking hack um, in, in, in that you have to be looking at the thing, the thing has to be generated, um, but it is, it, it is a, a, a affecting the, the electronics in your brain to, uh, to a detectable uh, state, and you can do it with a regular monitor and computer. So this, again, this is where I would really like to be. I, I haven't... Um, personally gotten my hardware dialed in enough to, to replicate these results, mostly because you, you need to, to, to track more points and specifically focus on the back of the brain. But I, I believe this is very doable at home, university, small groups, uh, and kind of the beginning of, of what is the, the, the current state of building blocks for, for doing interesting things with the brain. Um, but again, do you really want to go through all this trouble when you can just wear some really light glasses with an infrared tracker that are looking at your eyeball and you're looking up, you're looking over, you're looking right? Like it, it's there, there's definitely applications for this, um, and, and it's a it's an interesting proof of concept. Um, but it's it's to me this is you know a big part of the reality of EEG. It's 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 interesting. There, there's definitely clinical applications used for it every day. Um, but I think we all need to experiment much more and find creative things to do. Uh, this whole IBVA um, also has a very interesting integration for doing things like visualizations and, and music um, and, and, and who knows what else. So uh, just want to, again, give a, give a shout out um, where I got a lot of these resources. Uh, the, the dream team, uh, Masahiro Kahata, he's, uh, he's kind of the, the, the grandfather of all of this stuff, working on it. His, his first implementation of functional EEG uh, was on an Apple II, um, and uh, Willie's been doing the, the NeuroFox editions. Uh, Silver respun that red board, which is a great open source module. If you just need a good ADC module, it's a, it's a great reference design. Uh, Joel and Connor over at OpenBCI, look for them on the interwebs. You'll find a, a, a bunch of great talks, and then also uh, Backyard Brains in the, the Santiago makerspace for the uh, spiker box demonstration. Uh, and kitty tax, and uh, that's it. Thank you very much, and uh, yeah. <laughs>